Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sam, and thank you for joining us for another Essential Commissioning webinar series. This is the final one in our six-month installment, so thank you for hopping on. Uh, we are going to be talking about fundamentals of commissioning today, a uh, great topic with Al Para and Lauren Morris. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping notes. The presenters will be answering questions at the end of the presentation. So if you have a question, feel free to submit that anytime using the Q&A button and we'll get to it. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, please use the chat function, inform the panelists, and we will assist you. This presentation is being recorded and will be available for viewing within one week. And then finally, in terms of continuing education credit, everyone will receive a certificate of attendance if they stayed for the full webinar within 24 hours. For those of you online that are EMP certified or CXA certified, expect your credits from this entire series to be uploaded in a couple weeks here. So today's webinar, Fundamentals of Commissioning, we have Al LaPera with us who has over 40 years of experience in a broad range of building types, uh, educational, healthcare, commercial facilities, um, is, is engineering expertise focuses on systems commissioning, energy analysis, and energy auditing. So we're hearing some of that today. And then Warren has been involved in the construction industry since the mid 90s. He's been providing building commissioning and related services. He's been employed with the contractor role with building automation systems and the designer role for mechanical engineering consulting firms. So he has insight into perspective and all those disciplines and um, the unique involvement with the commissioning industry. So we're excited to have them both on. And I'm going to hand it off to Al to kick us off with the presentation today. Al? All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Glad you could attend. Uh... A good way to end off the year on understanding the fundamentals of commissioning. And with this one's going to be is geared more towards uh, facility managers and building owners, because we think that that is something that is really important that they need to understand. Because with the current buzzwords that, you know, uh, that we have of decarbonization, which commissioning deals with operational carbon, and that's the best way to look at it. We're going to see this become more and more important that the buildings have to operate like a, I joke around like a Swiss watch. Uh, and so uh, and how you can find and save energy and, and, and lower again, it's a term I'm bringing it out to you now. If you hadn't thought about it, the operational carbon of a building, that is what it takes to uh, operate the building. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, this is what we're talking about today. Um, the reasons why we're here, for the most part, we're going to peel back the onion of what uh, commissioning is uh, in both the new, new building environment and also in the existing building environment. And that's really more where it's geared towards you folks that are facilities uh, managers and building engineers. Uh, we're going to look at the, uh, the differences between the different commissioning types, because there is a handful. You'll learn about them today if you don't know about them. We're going to discuss uh, why an existing building uh, and an initial energy audit should be done. And then we're going to talk about the low-hanging fruit measures in each. And then we're going to talk about the uh, good, the bad, and the ugly, so to speak. Uh, so again, we're going to go a little history on, on commissioning. We're going to talk about overview of various forms. We're going to summarize the differences. Uh, I think the most important part I think you'll get out of this is going to be the good, the bad, and the ugly of commissioning, which uh, Lauren and I have between both of us a lot of experience. And then you're going to just see what I'm calling the Hall of Shame Gallery, which I think most of you will laugh about a little bit. Um, you know, again, we have a bunch of acronyms that are part of our everyday life, whether they, you know, especially uh, any of you have kids, they uh, big on social media. I still have to keep this little list on the side here for myself because I still don't get them all. Uh, I know with, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, laughing out loud and things like that, those are the ones I need, but the, other than that, but. For what we do, CX is commissioning, EBCX, which is existing building, 
the, the term that is becoming very popular today, and Lauren is going to talk about this in a little bit more detail later, FDT, FDD, which is fall detection and diagnostics. And that's basically that it will tell, tell us the, about how the building is doing. Uh, we were going to talk about monitor-based commissioning, uh, what a commissioning authority is, which is CXA. Uh, we're going to also go into what a BAS, which you guys should know, and so on. Uh, but I think the, the point is, is that there is a uh, acronyms that are part of our everyday lives that some of them you may or may not be familiar with. Um, the progression of, of CX has occurred that there was a guideline that was originally created by ASHRAE. Uh, it gained traction and really LEED is the one that brought it to the forefront, which we're closing in on almost 20 years now uh, with uh, LEED coming into existence and bringing LEED, uh, uh, bringing commissioning being required prior to that. Uh, there wasn't really much done prior to that. Uh, you know, we used to, I'm sure Lauren would agree, you know, 25 years ago, it was called making sure the project worked is why we did commissioning. You know, we didn't call it that. We just went out and, and kicked the tires because things, uh, the contractors thought they did it right. And the control guy thought he implemented it right. But uh, when it went to go into true operation is when we found that things didn't work. Um, then you wind up having uh, the energy codes right now, but the, the IBC, uh, um, I, uh, the IECC, I should say, has uh, made commissioning as from the 2013 energy code has become C408 has been the requirement for doing mandatory code required commissioning on HVAC systems for buildings with uh, an aggregate of 40 tons or greater. That's for new construction and or replacement of equipment. Um, and so, and then we're gonna also talk about a little bit uh, ongoing uh, uh, commissioning, and then you're going to see that where that uh, commissioning is being brought in from sometimes from the uh, the general contractor side of doing things. Um, but if you talk about what are systems that you commission, you can commission fan arrays, you can commission lighting. You know, this is an occupancy sensor. You can commission a generator. You can commission water heaters. You can commission the fire alarm system. Um, you can commission elevators, med gas. Um, you can commission uh, metering, which is a project that I've gotten involved with. Um, then there's a commissioning of the envelope itself, right? That's that's something new. We're not going to talk about that today, but I'm just letting you know you can. And, and I've been affectionately saying this forever. Uh, you can commission... Uh, PV systems, but the one I was about to say that I've been doing forever is, yeah, you can commission a doorknob and you laugh and you may think, what are you talking about that? But I'm sure you have card access in a lot of your buildings. That is a system. And that's what I mean by a doorknob, but, you know, you know, joking about it, you know, it's commissioning is really, and I want you to think about it is nothing more than making sure that the system or systems or uh, equipment operates properly, right? That's all it is. So, you know, so that's how you want to think about it. And Lauren? Thank you, Al. So from a facility management perspective, it's very important to understand what commissioning is and what the value is of commissioning to you in your operations and maintenance. Um, the bottom line for why we commission is to save energy um, and to, and to sus sustain the building performance that we have at the beginning of a project. So whether we're talking about a new building being constructed, an existing building that's been around for 20 plus years, um, there's always an opportunity for us to, to find uh, savings, energy savings. So commissioning is, is first and foremost uh, a quality assurance process, but it's also an investment in your property to maintain and sustain the, the building operation. And so um, we are, as mentioned in, in this slide here, we're putting all of these systems that Al had mentioned, 
even the doorknobs <laughs> uh, through their, their paces of, are these systems operating per the design intent? And there's been many studies done on the value and worth of commissioning. Uh, the most notable of one of those is from the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Uh, it was originally done in 2009. Uh, it was updated in 2017, and I believe that there has been an update as early as, as 2020 as well. And um, the next slide kind of is a summary of what those, um, those savings may be. So as you look at this, on the left-hand side, we have payback achieved. And as I mentioned before, commissioning is an investment in your property. And as investment that yields a return on investment to you. And so depending on the industry that you're in from on the far left, we have lodging and office, higher education, healthcare, inpatient, all of these for the most part have less than a two year payback on there. And from an energy savings perspective, you can look from anywhere from 16% for existing buildings to 13% uh, for new construction on annual energy savings. And so- and, Yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry, I was gonna bring something up. Go ahead. I was gonna say, and if you could look from this slide, you can see that the most complicated of types of projects like healthcare and laboratories have a tendency to have a lower payback because those systems have more moving pieces that would have a tendency that if they're not done right, could waste a lot of energy. Right. You have things like the amount of outside air for laboratory and healthcare uh, facilities, you know, um, managing the amount of outside air while balancing code and, and comfort um, can be, be done during the commissioning process. If, if I were to say to you, I had an investment that was going to yield 13 to 16%, I think uh, all of us would take that uh, investment. And so that's the numbers that we're looking for in, in the commissioning aspect of our, of our projects. So what is commissioning? Um, commissioning, I'd like to start off with talking about what commissioning is not. Um, all of these things that are listed up here are very important pieces to the commissioning process. We have test and balance. Um, if you were to ask a certain contractor or designer, consultant, what commissioning is, these things are going to come up. Test and balance, startup, engineer's site walk, punch list, if you will, uh, performance verification. Um, these things are very important and they are integral pieces of the commissioning process. But in and of themselves, independently, it is not commissioning. It's, it's, a very, it's a component of that. And as we'd mentioned in the previous slides, it's not limited to HVAC systems or control systems. Now we're getting seeing very much other auxiliary systems for smoke control, for example. Um, building envelope with fenestration, infiltration, um, roof leakage, these kind of, uh, any system that's building related can be commissioned. And so um, it's not routinely included in the professional design consultant fees. That is uh, a myth that's out there. Well, isn't my designer, isn't my engineer doing this already? The answer to that 99 out of 100 times is no. Um, and as well as it's MEP coordination is done inside the, the general contractor for the, the coordination between trades. And that's important for scheduling purposes. The commissioning takes all of this together under one umbrella as a total quality assurance process. An example of this is um, the, the USS Alabama. Going to the, the next slide there. Um, the Alabama was a battleship served in World War II. Uh, it was launched in February of 1942. Went out to sea for the first time. And on that initial voyage, everything, all the systems on that, on that boat um, from stern to stem. I don't, I'm not a Navy guy. So is that right? Uh, stern to stem. Stem to stern, I think it is. Front to back. Right? So, yeah. um, everything was done through with a fine tooth comb. The last thing you want is for your, your battleship to be thousands of miles from the coast in the middle of harm's way and to have problems with the systems. And so, as you can see, when it was commissioned was in August 16th, 1942. So it took six months to go through the battleship 
and to make sure that all the systems were operational, ready to go, to iron, the, get the bugs out, and, and make sure that it was ready for duty. And so we we apply that same process to building systems. We're making sure that it operates per the design intent prior to it being turned over to you as the facility management and the and the building owner. This slide here is is talking about when um, opportunities and and when a commissioning provider will come on board. At, when we're involved early on in the process, uh, the cost to fix an issue is definitely much easier than earlier than than later. For example, when we're doing design reviews and looking at, at piping layouts or equipment layouts, um, it's very much easier to change these things on paper once they've been installed and having to move those for maintenance purposes. So early on during conceptual and schematic uh, design development, much more uh, opportunity to identify opportunities for savings, as well as, as being able to minimize the cost of fixing those issues along the way. So if you get anything from this slide, start early, because the earlier you start, the better off you'll be. So we have uh, several types of commissioning that we're going to go through in this presentation. I'm going to start by talking about new building commissioning. And we're also going to be talking about how this applies to existing buildings, recommissioning, retro commissioning, and continuous commissioning or, or ongoing commissioning. And so new building commissioning, as, as we'd stated before, Commissioning is a quality assurance process. It's a systematic process as listed here on this slide of ensuring that all building systems perform interactively according to the design intent. As the ACG is a proponent of independent third-party verification, we, you want your commissioning provider to be independent of the design team and of the construction team. So there's no conflicts of interest there moving forward someone that has your back as your advocate. As part of this, we have, um, we as commissioning providers are, are looking at the design and the operation, trying to balance em energy optimization with occupant comfort as well. We do that through design reviews, which look at the maintainability of the system. We're trying to uh, sustain the energy performance of the system throughout the life of the building. As we go through and get into construction, we're also doing um, regular site observations and installation verifications. We wanna make sure that the systems are installed, set up and started up according to the per plans and spec and the design intent. And one thing to note for facilities managers, uh, we look very heavily at equipment access, equipment that's above the ceiling, um, equipment that may be hard to, to get to. We wanna make sure that a maintenance and operations tech can get to, this, to these systems to maintain them, to change the filters. And, and I, we can talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly <laughs> later on, but uh, having hard lid ceilings that have no access for VAV terminal units for, for any kind of, uh, or fan coils for filter changes. Uh, we're looking at the long term here and trying to make sure that it's sustainable throughout the uh, throughout the life of the project. And we do all this to prepare for uh, the functional performance testing. That is where the rubber meets the road. That that is all of this is auditions for the the main event, which is functional performance testing. We we take these systems and we take them through all of the different scenarios of how they are intended to operate and react to different uh, scenarios throughout the, the life of the building for power uh, failure, for example. What happens when, when a power failure occurs? Do we have the backup uh, energy, uh, the emergency generators coming on through the transfer switches and, and all of the backup equipment operating to where um, it's seamless? These are the kind of things that we're actually taking it through its paces. Taking it for a test drive actually is, is a good analogy there. If you're going out on the road and, and taking a car out and you're putting the windows up and down, the, the windshield wipers, air conditioning, seeing how fast it goes. That's what we're doing here in the new building commissioning 
is making sure that we're we're operating according to the design intent. So this next slide here um, outlines the different aspects of new building commissioning from the beginning to the end here. Uh, at the beginning, we have an owner's functional requirements. We're, we're helping you to document what your expectations are. What are your goals as a facility manager? Um, what would you like to see as far as energy performance of the building? How are you going to operate and maintain this building? So this becomes a, a live and dynamic document that we use as the basis for everything that we're measuring moving forward. Um, the basis of design is a document provided by your design team, which then tells us how we're going to fulfill the owner's functional requirements through the design. It's a high level narrative of the systems that are going to be designed and the criteria used for that design. As we then go through to the design, we're, we're regularly reviewing those designs um, for maintainability, for sustainability, and for functionality. And throughout construction, we have a lot of paperwork, um, checklists, testing scripts that we're using to document the installation, the startup, and the functionality of those systems. At the end, you're going to get a, a pretty healthy report that shows the documentation for all of these systems that then, um, then translate into O&M material of, of resource material for your operations and maintenance personnel on, on baseline operation for all of your equipment. So I'm going to turn the time back over to you, Al. All right, here we go. All right. So now the one thing that is really kind of is more geared to everybody that's on the call today to a certain degree, we hope, is that existing building commissioning is where after Warren or myself have commissioned the building initially, you take it over and it's a few years, few years down the road and you've seen that the energy has dropped off in, in your building and you wonder why is that that's happened, right? So we can come in and there's multiple ways of doing it. I'm gonna give you some of the lexicon language that you should understand. There's a thing called recommissioning, which I'll go into a little bit more detail. There's a thing called retro commissioning and I'll explain the difference. Then there's ongoing commissioning and monitor-based commissioning, which Lauren will talk about you know, in, towards the end. And then why do you wanna do this? Because they are energy and water use reductions. You can improve the um, IAQ of the building. Um, we've seen work order reductions, like in other words, if things are working better and your thermostats are calibrated and the systems are calibrated and the BAV boxes are operating uh, appropriately, you're getting less phone calls, which means your staff can focus on maintaining the building instead of going to find out why Mrs. McGillicuddy is, 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 is warm or cold or whatever the, the problem, I'm not saying that you're not going to have those calls, but that you, they cut, they cut some downs. And then we've also found that if you can improve the IAQ inside the building, you've also improved occupant productivity. If you start to think about the, the 330, 300 uh, um, scenario where if you think about it, that $3 a square foot is what it costs to operate a facility. There's $30 a square foot. That's the um, rent on a facility. But then there's $300 a square foot, which is the, uh, the, the salaries, okay? So if you can start to improve the environment for the people within the facility, they're gonna be more productive and they're gonna, you know, if they're making widgets, they're gonna make more widgets at the same, uh, uh, time frame that they were doing before if they have a better environment. It reduces risk mitigation because people are healthier. Uh, your insurance rates go down, the, the, the tenants go, rates go down, uh, and you are going to improve bench uh, performance benchmarking. Well, you're, we're going to talk about that a little bit more, but you're going to start to see, especially now where this whole thing about decarbonization, you're starting to see places like D.C., Boston, New York City, Chicago, uh, Seattle, um, San Francisco, the ones that all come to mind, they, the, those cities, Orlando is another one, have benchmarking criteria in the state of, of, of 
of Washington, they're making it mandatory by the year 2025 that if you are not meeting those benchmarking criteria, that is uh, a KBTU per square foot, your building is going to be fined on a daily basis until you get there. So this is going to become a really important thing. And, you know, uh, we're going to see that this is going to start to go across. So let's talk about what is recommissioning. Recommissioning is basically the way the building was originally designed. And you're bringing it back to its original condition. That's all it is. Nothing more, nothing less. You're not improving it. You're not doing anything. It's basically it, whatever the, the air quantities, whatever the control sequences were, whatever anything was, is being brought back to that exact condition as when it was when it was originally constructed. Now, what is retro commissioning? Retro commissioning is uh, the program is designed to now look at, think about how many buildings that you may have had that was a normal office building and now it's a call center, right? It has changed what it's doing. So now you got to go back in and either uh, alter the amount of outside air or conversely, it was a call center. Though all those people have moved out, it's a regular office building. Now you can look at how you can reduce the amount of outside air because you don't have that high concentration of people. There might be some things that could be done. Uh, and so this is where in the retro commissioning process, a audit traditionally is done an energy audit to be able to see where energy savings and where uh, control sequence tweaks can be done uh, and looked at and uh, improve the performance of the building. That's what a retro commissioning process does. Now you start to look at uh, continuous commissioning or ongoing commissioning. This is uh, where uh, buildings, and it has been proven in, I wish I would have put a few of those slides in there, of where once a building's operated over three to five years, you can watch if you have not gone back and done anything to your sensors or anything, they will degradate and you'll see energy performance start to drop off over um, those three to five years. That's why if you think about it, LEED has become, come back and said that every three years, your building, three to five, your building should be commissioned. The Lawrence Berkeley report has also endorsed that. There's been a showing how energy to keep your building um, operating in a tip top condition is, is the way to have it continue to have it recommissioned or retro commissioned, but continuous commissioning monitors it on a daily basis. Well, a monthly basis, it doesn't say daily. Uh, you could do it daily, but it's usually on a monthly basis where it looks where things have fallen off, where you start to see, uh, let's say like a VAD box has its heater stuck on, I'm sure you've had that happen. And, in, and your guys have not been able to get, didn't notice it yet, uh, but, you know, you would have wasted a lot of energy had it stayed on. Uh, and again, uh, the continuous commissioning is the process where it will go uh, optimized throughout the life of the building. It's always, you're constantly looking at it. So you're not waiting until the retro commissioning process. If you find out that all of a sudden the call center that was on the fifth floor is going away, well, now you know by talking to the your continuous commissioning provider, he can come back and he can look at the how how much outside air could be reduced, or is there any control strategies that have to be implemented, or things like that, to where you can keep the building operating on a uh, on an optimum basis. And here, just this slide, which came out of that same uh, Lawrence Berkeley report, shows that if you did nothing, how energy rise would go up. But you could see by going, whether it is uh, just doing a, re a conventional retro commissioning or periodic recommissioning, you can see how much you'll save. But you can see that if you add um, monitor-based commissioning and along with everything else, you can see how much energy savings you can potentially put into your building. So we're ready for poll question number one.
All right. Um, Duff, I thought you were going to put the poll question up. It's up there. Oh, okay. Oh, I see it. Sorry. I apologize. I have, I apologize. I got three screens and it showed up on the one screen I didn't look at. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right. Which of the following is not existing building commissioning? You have single choice, retro commissioning, continuous commissioning, recommissioning, or new building commissioning. And let's see what the answers were. All right. Uh, most of you got it right, which is good. Um, uh, I'm really, uh, this is great. Wow. I just, we have a lot of people, Lauren, that yeah. are on this thing. I didn't realize how many people. We've got a lot of people on here. We have a lot of people. This is great. Um, if I sound excited, it's because I am. I love when we have a great audience. Um, all right. Uh, so what is retro commissioning? I think I talked about it again, is that this is where we go in and we will look at and see how the building is con currently operating. And we will look at on the HVAC controls. We'll look at the scheduling. We'll look at the lighting. Uh, but we find, believe it or not, a lot of the fixes tend to be low cost in nature. A lot of times we find that it's bad sensors, we find, which are very inexpensive in the overall scheme of things. We find that it's schedules. We find that things have been overridden and they've forgotten. You know, Mrs. McGillicuddy likes it really cold in her office on, on, on Fridays because she has uh, all her staff in there. So she will call up. Uh, the building and say, hey, could you put that my, my office down to 68 on Fridays? Well, unfortunately, the building engineer may just make it 68 in her office all the time. And since she likes it cooler anyway, she never complains. So, but it stays and it uses more energy, but there's a series of them that go on within the building. Uh, why do you want to do a retro commissioning process? Okay, uh, energy costs are always expected to rise. Um, Sometimes buildings, you know, are getting used more because new construction, uh, because of the economic alloy. Like right now, because of supply chain issues, uh, we've heard that there are a lot of buildings that are putting some starts on hold because the cost of material and, and so on has jumped precipitously. Um, sometimes they, people do it because it's the right thing to do for their employees and community goodwill. Um, there are benefits intended to be long lasting. There's, we see that most stuff, is, most uh, ECMs, which are energy conservation measures, um, are simple, uh, simply uh, have a simple payback of less than two years. And based on the Lawrence Berkeley report of 2009, and these numbers have gone down a little bit, um, or improved, I should say, that is, uh, is between 7 and 26% with an average of 15. I want to say now it's between 2 and 15 with an average of about 7. Uh, you know, again, uh, retro commissioning is where you you evaluate and, and performance testing of an existing building. You look at the design, the installation, the setup, the test and balance, the control, the optimization, and the, the ongoing maintenance of the facility. Sometimes uh, we're the facility engineer's best friend because we, you know, sometimes they can go and complain and say they need things done, but we can point it out. But when you are the commissioning agent, and I'm sure Lauren, you've had to do this too, is you wanna make sure you have the building engineer that you are simpatico trying to do this because you don't wanna make them look bad, um, you know, because you know, you want him to, you, you want him to be in your court when he, when they go to him, hey, this guy, Al or Lauren has suggested all these things, what do you think? You don't want them to go, yeah, those guys don't know what they're talking about. And it's mainly because uh, you've sabotaged him because you, you made him look bad because he, you know, he didn't have enough uh, manpower for maintenance, which is not his fault. But so you got to, you know, you got to look at who your client is, as the saying goes. Um, the other thing is that there is one of the things we find when we go in is this thing is an old slide. I brought it back out of, uh, out of retirement, so to speak. Uh, the gas pedal bay, um, 
brake pedal syndrome. That is a very true thing. It's like, think about it. If you put your foot on the gas and also put your foot on the brake, you're creating resistance. And so you would eat up more gas in your car if you actually drove like that. That slide, it kind of reminds me of my father, rest his soul. He was a truck driver, 18-wheel uh, truck driver for like 25 or 30 years. And he drove his car like that because he was so used to using both feet uh, all his entire career. But we find that improper uh, uh, DISCOM is energy-saving opportunities. HVA system, HVAC systems, um, where if you can eliminate this, you know, brake pedal scenario, you will save a lot of energy. Uh, you know, basically, I go, this is old data, but they haven't changed a whole lot that we find that 40% of the energy waste is through HVAC issues, 33% is through sensors that are not operating properly. I have a, I had a client, I was always telling uh, an owner this yesterday, I had, a, I had a client that he operates a large uh, central energy plant and every 14 to 16 months, he goes and he changes all his water temperature sensors. He doesn't try to calibrate them, he doesn't do anything. He goes, goes and replaces them. He's found that he's saved more energy and money and have correct billing by doing that. Now, sensors, as Lauren will probably attest to, that only those water sensors are the cheapest ones that you could buy. They're like 15 bucks, 20 bucks a piece. When you get into duct sensors and other ones, they're really a lot more money and you really would want to invest the time in, in recalibrating them, which is not really all that hard. And then there's uh, missing equipment, which is uh, things like the belts are not done right and not operating properly. So th those are the things of what we find that needs to needs to be done. Al, can I, I, I interject yeah. here real quick? Right ahead. I want to just talk a little bit about um, one other acronym in there called Facility Improvement Measure or an FIM, which right. a lot of times when we're doing retro commissioning, it is based on energy savings and we're trying to identify opportunities for energy savings. But there are times when, as Al had mentioned, you have a, a, a standard office building that's now a call center where the occupancy is maybe twice of what it was originally intended for. In order to improve the indoor air quality, uh, you need to increase the amount of ventilation and outside air to that, uh, to that space. And so not all uh, measures uh, from retro commissioning are going to be energy savings. Some of them may be um, a detriment, but is in order to meet code and to have an adequate uh, indoor air environment, um, those things will will come up as well. And, and and you're right about that, Lauren. And one other thing I'd like to point out on FEMS, some of the FEMS are also ones that are life safety related. For example, like if you have a parking garage that has uh, CO sensors in it or NOx sensors that are going to energize the fans, right? If they're not operating, if they're not working, those fans a lot of times are off. So that's a life safety thing. Or if you have a large central energy plant, you have your a, a refrigerant, emergency refrigerant exhaust fan is broken or a belt is broken. That is a life safety issue that you want to make sure is maintained. So Lauren is correct. Sometimes there's a lot of FIMS that have no energy savings and some actually cause energy, like the one I talked about, uh, the way he said with outside air. Same thing would be with the garage exhaust fans, especially if they've been off and now they're going to be energized. Whatever. I don't care if they're going to run an hour a day. That hour a day is more energy than they've used with them all being off consistently. Uh, what is an energy audit? An energy audit is basically the investigative phase of a retro commissioning project. Uh, it is the roadmap where it determines where energy waste is in the building. And I want to make it clear that an energy audit is not a study or an assessment. Okay, it's a, a building assessment will come in and we'll look at your equipment and will tell you, yes, your chiller is at the end of its uh, life in the next three years, and you should put this in your in your um, 
upgrade and, and maintenance planning for, uh, for expenditures over the next couple of years. No, the, uh, an energy audit, which could have an assessment piece to it, not saying you can't do them, but they're not the same. An energy audit is the thing that is going to um, look at how the building is actually performing does it meet, is it using more energy than it should? What is the benchmarking of it? And, and, and again, well, those are the terms of benchmarking is determining the building's EUI. And what is an EUI, which is the energy uh, uh, intensity of the building, right? Energy unit intensity, which is done in KBTU per square foot. Traditionally, that's what it's been done at or, or measured at. We're going to be looking at how the facilities actually operates now, regardless of how it was intended to operate when it was designed previously. Uh, we're going to uh, perform a calibrated energy model. What is a calibrated energy model? I'll talk about it real quickly. Is we take, we look at your energy bills, and we and basically it comes up with an EKG chart, right? So we'll look at that and then we'll do, depending on a, uh, the building, we'll wind up doing an energy model and we'll overlay what we see the energy consumption is to that EKG chart of energy usage. And a lot of times we see that they are very close as far as performing. And, uh, but I have done some where it's been almost like a straight line and that automatically told me that things are running 24-7 is, is things are not... Uh, are being not uh, operated based on the ambient temperatures, right? They, they're not being influenced on the other, there's something else going on. And then we're gonna, it's gonna determine what pro proposed changes or ECMs, which is uh, energy conservation manager, or there's another term, EEM, which is energy efficiency measure. Uh, why retro, retro commissioning saves energy, uh, and it's not a study. We talked about that, and we talked about it, it gives the owner uh, proof of what they already know, that the building's not operating. It provides um, where to start, and, and it scales all the non-health paper, and we go and we look at, we find the money of where the building is operating. A lot of times we find that it has to do with scheduling. Sometimes you're leaving your building on longer than you need to. Or I found buildings that run 24 seven, their outside air is 24 seven. There's a whole bunch of things when they don't need to do it. Where, you know, I like this slide about, you know, the, the dog digging the hole in the ground. That's what we are. We're, we're uncovering the bones in the building on how we can save energy. And you got to think about it. Most of the building stock is pre-1990, right? Uh, there's a lot of buildings. I, I do a lot of work in D.C. and a lot of buildings now are in the process of um, retrofitting their chillers. And you say, wow, the 30-year-old building. But don't forget, those chillers only run six months out of the year because don't forget, it's in a colder climate. And where I am here in Florida, where chillers run basically 12 months out of the year. Uh, we're gonna look at energy saving control strategies that were missing the original design. Uh, we're gonna look at neglected maintenance that is wasting energy and, and uh, causing IAQ problems. Um, you, know, you know, sometimes the building engineer thinks they're saving money. I, as like Lauren alluded to, talked about before, the outside air uh, I've gone to buildings where the, 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 the building engineer was tasked with saving energy. And the first thing that he did was he goes and he closes the outside air dampers. He thinks that that's the way, which he's right. He's going to save a lot of energy with those outside air dampers closed. Unfortunately, um, you know, when I look at, uh, when I, as I'm walking through, I said, so how much does it cost you on the painting of the walls that have all the mold by the entrance now, and how much does it cost you to clean all that up? And they look at me and go, how did I know that? Well, uh, when I joke with them and tell them I'm a swami, I said, the reason I know all that is because now you've made your building negative. So during the hot summer, humid months, you're bringing all that in. And during, and so the mold is growing on the walls. And then in the wintertime, you're bringing all that cold air in and your, and your building is a lot colder than it needs to be. And then it looks at the 
uh, building usage and floor plan changes. And we're on from poll question number two. Um, what does uh, an ECM stand for? It is a, um, still haven't seen the poll come up yet. I'm looking at the right screen this time, Lauren. <laughs> Uh, but we can talk about it. It's a, an electronic content management. It's every child matters. It's existing uh, uh, customer management, uh, engineering coordination memo, or it's a energy conservation measure. Well, Duff. Oh, well. Um, I get, you know, we don't have enough time for you guys to put it. All right, here it is. There we go. If you can, quickly go ahead and, and uh, put it in which one you think. Again, it's um, energy content management. It's every child matters, existing consumer management, engineering coordination memo, or energy conservation measure. Let's see how we... How we did there, Duffy. All right. 95% of you got it right. I'm proud of you. I love it. All right. And now I am going to turn it over to my friend here, Mr. Lauren. Okay. So we have very quickly gone through existing building commissioning and new construction, new building commissioning. And now I want to talk about what monitor-based commissioning is. Monitor-based commissioning is a tool that can be applied to the previous processes that we've talked about. It can be used in existing building commissioning. It can be used in new construction commissioning, recommissioning, and retro commissioning. It's a wonderful tool. And so this is the definition given by the Lawrence Berkeley uh, Laboratory. So it's a process that maintains and continu continuously improves the building and performance over time. And the focus of monitor-based commissioning is to cover as much ground as you possibly can. Um, and it uh, analyzes a large amount of data on a continual basis. And so why do we use monitor-based commissioning? So in the, in the next slide there, Al, we have a graph that shows um, operation over time. And in the engineering world, we have a term called entropy. Entropy basically says that over a period of time, the performance of a system is going to degrade. And um, that is no different in building systems. Over the, the course of years, uh, regardless of, of operation and maintenance, we, we have a degradation in system performance. And so, over the years, you can see where that uh, percent of energy wasted increases. With monitor-based commissioning, we can continuously monitor the performance of systems and make the necessary adjustments made to lower that and then keep that in a sustainable uh, manner. So we, it saves energy, maintains occupancy comfort, and is focused to find the most cost-effective solutions to achieve successful results. So how is this implemented? In there are many monitor-based commissioning platforms, okay? Um, we're not here to sell one over the other. So the commonality of all of these is that you have a building automation system that's collecting data, trend data. Um, you're having a lot, of, depending on the size of the, the building, you're having data come in for temperatures, pressures, status. The, Monitor-based commissioning platform is, is taking that data from the building automation system. It's sending it to the diagnostics platform through uh, either email, it could be a secure FTP site, um, many different ways to get that information from the building automation system to the diagnostics platform. And a lot, all of these are very cognizant of IT security. And so, uh, most of the time, that is a one-way direction going from the building automation system to the diagnostics platform. Once you get into the diagnostics platform, then we do the number crunching, we look at the trend data, 
and it sends out, it packages this into a pretty user interface that allows you to look at the data and see what's going on in your building in a very uh, easy and quick manner there. So with that, I wanna talk about the automated fault detection and diagnostics. That is as an integral piece of monitor based commissioning. So in the next slide we have, um, I started off my career working at Honeywell as a controls engineer. And I spent a lot of time, a lot of time setting up trend data on building automation systems and to formatting that data. And what automatic fault detection and diagnostics does is it, it creates configurable rules where you're, you're looking at all of this mountain of data is coming in and you're setting up rules to look for anomalies in this trend data. And based on that anomaly, it, it will then have diagnostic alerts. It's going to come to a skilled building commissioning professional uh, who's gonna be able to look at this and uh, determine whether that's an actual uh, issue or whether it's, it's noise in the data. Um, I, an, an analogy to this is, is triage. When you bring a patient into the ER, um, uh, is this a, a is this a, a life-threatening uh, scenario that we're in? Is it something that can wait? Um, we're prioritizing those things that we identify, and then we're going through and then addressing those issues one by one. I know um, one of the questions, I looked ahead at the questions there, but um, the monitor-based commissioning platform will help you identify issues in a, in, earlier on during, uh, your, in, you, don't, you won't be waiting uh, a large amount of time it will help you identify these issues earlier on in the process, but it does not automatically fix those issues either. And if it's a broken damper or a leaky valve, you'll know way ahead of time, but you still have to have those boots on the ground to go out there and make those changes in the, in the systems. And Lauren, probably one of the things we should point out though is, it, you know, you should be very integrated with, when you bring this whole idea of this FED in and the automated that you should set whatever your triggers are gonna be that what is gonna be truly a problem. Because if you remember, Lawrence Berkeley did that report of where it came out and they found that like 75% of the things were a, a lot of nuisance trips. It's like, think about it. You facilities guys will probably be nodding your heads. Like until you disabled all the uh, alarms you were getting on your filters where you know you might have a, 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 a uh, a service that's going to change your filters, let's say every six weeks. And you know, when you get up right around that mark, all of a sudden you would wind up with, you know, a hundred different alarms because all your air handlers are going off that, but you, you ignore them. So, so, or you'd reset them to something higher. So you don't have to worry about it. But the point that, would, that I'm driving at is that you got to make sure whoever sets up your diagnostics is making sure that they get rid of the white noise as Lauren talked about it. Yeah. yeah. So this next slide is, a, is an example of the data that comes out of monitor-based commissioning. As you can see, there's a lot of data here. Um, and one of the questions that I always get is, well, what is, isn't my building automation system already doing this? I'm getting alarms, but what additional value do I get out of monitor-based commissioning? And, and the answer to that is, a standard alarm for building automation system will give you uh, an alarm for when an equipment is off, when it should be on, or vice versa. You'll have an alarm for temperature thresholds or pressure thresholds. Um, what monitor-based commissioning is going to help you identify are those things that are not alarmable in the building automation system. For example, in this, is this example, we have an unstable valve operation going on here. The valve is hunting. And the, the building automation system is not going to give you an alarm that the, the valve is hunting. Uh, other examples of this are uh, building pressurization. Uh, when a building uh, goes from negative pressure into or positive pressure into negative pressure or vice versa, depending on what the criteria is, how do you know, for example, when that's going to happen other than looking at the actual uh, sensor there? Um, seeing where that, those issues are as far as your outside air intake versus your exhaust. Um, 
broken uh, actuators. Uh, on many occasions, you have an actuator that uh, is broken, but from the building automation system, it looks like it's going just fine. But in the end, the damper or the valve is not operating correctly. You'll be able to see those kind of hidden issues as a result of this that will help your operations and maintenance personnel get ahead of the game. So I see we're, we're getting pretty close. So I'm gonna roll through this pretty quickly here. The benefits of monitor-based commissioning, uh, being able to very quickly and efficient, efficiently get through a large amount of data uh, at once, being able to identify issues and performance issues before it causes, uh, as, as Alice said, Miss McGilligutty to be uh, uh, unhappy and, and get mad. And, and it also allows you to do this in a cost-effective manner, troubleshooting. Your, your technicians will know what they're looking for when they get out in the field instead of having to do a lot of pro time problem solving out in the field. Uh, it also, on the next slide, it says that we're, we're getting ahead of the curve, basically, as a result of this. And it is performance insurance. You're, you'll be able to go to the powers that be, and uh, you'll be able to show them how the building is being maintained and improved on a continual basis. Finally, before we get to the last poll question, um, it, we're getting to a steady state of operation. At the turnover of a building, there's always things that uh, are, are still being ironed out with the systems operation. Commissioning doesn't solve 100% of all of the issues. And it takes some time during that post-occupancy phase of being able to iron those out. And monitor-based commissioning is a tool that will help you reduce energy consumption and demand and transition from that reactive uh, maintenance into a more preventative maintenance model there. So we'll go to the next uh, poll question here and bring that up. Monitor-based commissioning can be implemented in new building commissioning, retro commissioning, recommissioning, or all of the above. I don't know if we'll have that come up or not. Yeah, Duff. For the sake of time, I think we'll just say all of the above. As we've mentioned, it's a tool that can be used in all of that, now that I've given you the answer. <laughs> there it is. There we go. Okay. All so right, then. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say, and here we are, we're, we're gonna talk about, we don't have a whole lot of time, but what we find with the, the you know, there's the good, the bad, and the ugly, you know, the, the one thing about any commissioning agent, uh, at least that I've found, good commissioning agents are the ones that are just, pointing out the issues. They're not telling you how they would have designed it. They're telling you concrete things that this is a, this design seat, this control sequence doesn't work for these following reasons. If, if you have a commissioning agent that comes in, this is, this is Al's opinion. You have a commissioning agent that comes in and goes, well, if it was me, I would have done this. Send that guy home or that lady home because that's not what you want. You want somebody that is, looking at it from experience and saying, this is what we've been through. This is what's not worked in the past. This is how we see it. So, um, you know, so, you know, uh, unfortunately, uh, I think we had more than we wanted to, but we're, we're going to go a little bit late if everybody can. Just want to, uh, Lauren, we can give some questions. Let's just show them our quick um uh, Halls of shame, if you think. Okay, yeah. So we can get some questions out of it. I didn't mean to, if you have a, a, a one, I'm sorry, I cut you off. If you have something you'd like to say of one of our good, bad, and the ugly. I uh, know, I'm fine. We can go into, we can go into the hall of shame there. Yep, there's the hall of shame. Um, and we got the duck break. This is, you know, you can't make with the slides you're going to see now, you can't make this stuff up. Putting things too high. Um, you know, actually, the National Electric Code makes it is supposed to be about six foot six, if I remember. With the National Electric Code, is the furthest you should be able to do because it's dangerous, if not. Um, here is right versus wrong. So the first thing, 
We have missing valves that have to be put in. There are missing unions that have to be there if you ever have to maintain it. And then there's missing insulation that should have been there. Um, you know, then you have a duct that's not connected, right? <laughs> yeah, this is real, folks. Uh, I like this. This is that's a kitchen exhaust fan that is blowing up right adjacent to the uh, the coil and the, their idea of fixing it for the outside air and for not getting it on is putting a piece of plywood. <laughs> um, then, you know, that open back there is the return air in that little shiny little spot back there that you're trying to get it in and then wonder if it doesn't work right. Now, and now from the gallery of what you were thinking here, you know, how do they expect to connect that duct off with the, with, with the wall in the way? And it's not the mechanic. This was probably not the mechanical guy. I literally had this happen to me. And it had to do because they shot the, the, the walls in the wrong spot. Mm -hmm. And you have this. And this is uh, the fire protection guy came in and he put it in after the fact. He goes, you know, the mechanical guy didn't put it in this way. It would have made it more difficult. He would have moved it out of his own way. It's just, it's just other uh, contractors doing their, their thing and not paying attention. This is the one I liked the best. I don't know how anybody was expecting to ever get that in there. And so now we'll just go to some questions. And Sam, do you have some questions for us? Absolutely, I do. Let's uh, jump in here. Uh, first question is, could you elaborate on the code commissioning with buildings containing over 40 tons of cooling? Yes, um, the, the C408, which is in all the IECC, the uh, International uh, building code, C408 states that it is uh, 480,000 uh, BTUs is the threshold to start of commissioning. But that is in aggregate. So whether you have, let's say, a hotel with 41 ton units in it, you have to commission it. Um, it's one 40 ton unit, you have to commission it. So that's where that part goes. And the other thing is that also with the code is that once you do the uh, you you've hit that forty ton threshold, or I should say six hundred and fifty thousand BTUs of heating. Again, I since I live in Florida, more cooling is the more dominant. But you can if somebody puts in a boiler in a building that has no cooling but it only has heating. If you have a six hundred and fifty thousand BTUs of or greater of heating, you have to commission it. And once you've hit that threshold, now you have to do the, the domestic water heaters and lighting controls are required all the time, regardless, there's no threshold of if you if you if there's lighting controls and what I'm talking about is occupancy sensors, daylight sensors, any of that, whatever that is required, you have to um, commission commission 25 percent of them. The code doesn't say that, but that is the standard of looking at it. HVAC is a little different. They talk about you have to do all the equipment. Now, your VAV boxes in theory are not included in that. It's a good idea to do them. You don't have to, but you know the, the code requirement is for major equipment. So that is uh, chillers, pumps, cooling towers, air handlers, heaters. But once you get to the VAV boxes are not necessary, thermostats are not necessary, exhaust fans are not necessary, but as far as the code sees it, but you should be, should be doing, and I normally include them. I hope that answers that person's question. Okay, thank you. Um, quick question here. Someone, has saw, someone saw owner's functional requirements on an older slide. They're asking, was that supposed to be owner project requirements? Ah, there are yeah. uh, there are many names for it. We had owners' facilities requirements. Um, there's also owners' project requirements. Um, 
in the old days, it was design intent documents um, for, for lead and for um, retro commissioning. There's also a document called the current facilities requirement, so a CFR. So there's a whole bunch of acronyms there that mean the same thing of yes. documenting the owner's expectations. Right. And if you, any of you have been involved in a lead project, like it, it, the OPR was the original, it, it is that the OPR, just to define that real quickly, an owner project requirement talked about everything from soup to nuts. The ones that we are taught, that Lauren and I are talking about, have to do more with the facilities equipment, whether it's the boilers, chillers, air handlers, the equipment within the building. They could, you can add other things to it. It can grow it and make it to even talk about the elevators, uh, talk about smoke control testing and so on. You can expand it to whatever you want, but it traditionally has been about maintaining the HVAC uh, plumbing lighting controls. Okay, got it. Thank you. Uh, about three questions left, just in case sure. Al, you need to run any point. No, no worries. Keep going. Okay. Okay. Um, so a question about AIQ. Aside from confirming or verifying proper condition and filtered ventilation within a space, what else can I do to improve the AIQ of a space? Well, uh, well, first you have to, you know, you have to understand whether, you know, what your environment is. Do you have what what is your temperature in your mid in your humidity, right? Ashray, and you know, because of COVID, it became really clear that we find that you want to keep, and Ashray has been beating this drum forever. You want to keep your building humidity between 40 and 60 percent, right? They found just so for everybody's information on the health and wellness side, uh, they find that uh, any kind of influenza, once it gets below 40 percent, the influenza. Uh, rate increases of people of spreadability of death and so on. They found this like actually oddly enough in third world countries where they were doing surgeries and they don't have air conditioning uh, uh, environments a lot of times. And they found the colder that it gets and the less humid that it got, it was worse for the patients. The other, so you want to know what the temperature humidity is. You got to humidity. Uh, again, is uh, we find in most buildings, depending on where you are, sometimes 72, 74. But one of the other things you may want to look at, you want to look at, um, if you're looking at the IAQ, is uh, you should figure out what your total VOCs are, uh, uh, which is the contaminants in the air. You want to look at your CO2. You know, the higher the CO2, the, the worse people feel within the building. And traditionally, if you go by uh, OSHA, OSHA says you shouldn't be more than um, 700 parts per million greater than ambient. So ambient is around 450 to 500 outside. So inside shouldn't be greater than 1200. So you should get uh, there's some tools. And I, I don't own any company, so I'm not selling you one. Uh, Aware is, uh, has, uh, um, uh, has this Omnistat that does um, is one that does temperature, humidity, um, uh, PM 2.5, uh, CO2, uh, and total VOC. So if you ever wanted to just bring it around the building to get any idea, if you get some complaints or you have an idea, that's probably one of the easiest ways to be able to do it and improve it. Like if you're not, if you're bringing too much outside air or if your cooling coils are not bringing it down low enough, you'll see your humidity, you'll start to go up and so on. I hope that answered that person's question. Okay, um, another person had a question about software. So does monitoring-based commissioning using a software like Clockworks, Analytics, or Facility Grid correct issues found, or do they simply flag the issues and then you act to resolve them? Yeah, I, I think we covered that in the, I saw that question come up, but it will help you identify those issues. It, it's not an automated resolution, so you would still have to identify those and then have the, the controls tweaking or a, a technician to go out there and, and maintain or fix whatever's identified. 
I think everybody should also understand that false detection diagnostics is the way of the future. I know it's coming from the old guy in the room here, but is, you know, and, but the reason I'm saying that is because there's a piece of equipment, uh, a packaged rooftop unit that Captive Air, which is the kitchen hood folks, they uh, sell this 100% outside aid. I'm not selling it for them. I'm just telling you that I was fascinated by it that as part of their normal diagnostics that they do FDD and what they're believing in selling is that they have all the data to know if, you know, because they read, so let's say a bearing on a, on a compressor. Well, when they see that that compressor bearing goes up to a certain temperature, they know based on historical data, that compressor is going to fail within the next two to three weeks, and they will send a note to the owner and say, hey, by the way, your compressor is, is starting, we start to see this issue, you may want to think about, you know, having a PM on it, and you may have to uh, replace it. So, you know, this is, it's only going to get more sophisticated as AI and so on become more and more commonplace. Sam? Okay, hey, thank you. Um, yeah, let's sneak in just two last questions here. Sure. Um, someone had an interesting point about energy conservation measures. They said, what do you do with items that save no energy, might increase energy, such as improving AIQ? Uh, should we try and use a more enveloping acronym like FIM, Facility Improvement Measures, to move away from ECMs? What are your thoughts? Well, okay, mm -hmm. Lauren. Well, we in the in the upcoming standard for ECG, we do designate between FIMS facility improvement measures and ECMs. Um, if I heard the question correctly, what what do we do uh, when we're encountering FIMS? I think it's our as we're going through the building and identifying. It's it's our responsibility as their consultant, as their advocate, to be able to put everything out on the table for them for consideration with the caveat that they know that it may uh, actually decrease the energy efficiency. But as Al had mentioned, it's $300, you know, what was it, $300 a square foot for the employment salary. Um, if we have inadequate ventilation, for example, how is that, is that going to affect um, the the effectiveness of the workers and the employees in there. And so um, ultimately it's not our decision. It's, it's, it's our scope to provide all the different recommendations and then work with the owner and facilities manager on what works best for them with their budget. Uh, I, could, I could tell you that what I have found from uh, doing a lot of energy audits and, and, and when I come back and I, I've seen buildings where we talked about saving a couple of hundred thousand dollars a year if they implemented what we suggested. And you would think people would jump on that like white on rice, as they would say. And they don't because we find, especially with, with uh, office buildings, the first thing I get from the building uh, manager is this going to interrupt or bother my tenants? The minute you say it could be, they don't want to do it anymore because those are their salaries. So what you have to, the way you almost have to phrase it is the way Lauren brought up to how I had said it. You have to say how it's going to improve their environment, how they're going to be more productive, how they're going to that, you know, and that productivity is gonna save them money. A good example of that, which I, some may or may not know about is that lighting has a color rendering index for every bulb. Well, if you, and the minimum threshold of your uh, CRIs on a bulb should be 78. You go, all right, I didn't know about that. It's, and why do you care? Well, if you get below a 78 on a CRI, the, the people that are in that space with that lighting will wind up having headaches and they won't know why they're having a headache. It's coming from the color rendering of the bulb. 
And so their productivity clearly is going down because they have a headache, they'll have more sick days and so on. So by changing those bulbs out to something of 78, 80 or greater, productivity is going to go up and they're going to save, um, while it may cost a little bit more for those better bulbs, but they're getting more productivity. I hope that answered that person's question. Okay, thank you. Uh, the final question where there was just asking what qualifications should I be seeking um, in a building commissioning agent? And I'm just going to say that Al and Warren had a had a slide in the beginning where they called out a couple organizations that offer that. Um, best to have a Department of Energy and ANSI recognized certifications. Um, I, I okay. Would, I yeah. Yep. And I, I, I yep. would just say one more thing with that is that there are a handful of um, organizations that have uh, uh, commissioning accreditation. Um, you know, clearly us being ACG and EMA, you know, we, you know, you know, sometimes you won't always get some commissioning agents do not do a lot of the energy auditing. So when you're going out, and you are talking and you put an RFP out for them, you wanna make sure that they either show you samples or give you some criteria that they have done energy auditing and retro commissioning in some fashion. And they're not just new building commissioning agents. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying anything about my brother that only do one thing, but existing, it's like, think about it this way. If you had a Lamborghini and you needed to have it tuned up, you wouldn't bring it to the Ford dealership. Nothing wrong with Ford, and I'm not saying anything, but there's a difference of sophistication. But oddly enough, the Lamborghini guy could work on the Ford. That doesn't mean the Ford guy can work on the Lamborghini. So, and I think when you're going out and looking for commissioning agents, you want to make sure that they are well versed or their organization, not the particular person with their organization that could give you the full gamut of being able to give you a, a turnkey, in a sense, um, analysis and be able to perform it. Lauren, do you agree? I wholeheartedly agree with that. Okay. Parting words on choosing commissioning agent. Okay, um, Al and Warren, thank you for, for hopping on. I know I, I pushed you guys past your time, but want to make sure we answer as many questions as we can. No, I was happy done. to do it. Yep. Great. Okay, um, thank you both. Uh, CX Energy ACG puts on our annual conference. It is happening in 2023 in May. We're going to be heading to Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas. We're excited to see you there. Um, just to flag, the price goes up after December 31st, so take advantage of registering now. Government officials, code authority, authorities, facility managers that are online today, you can register for just $99, and that's brand new. We've never offered this before, so be sure to take advantage of that. And ACG members, you do receive one free complimentary pass. So thank you all for joining us for the Essential CX webinar series this year. We'll start up again next year in the summer and have a wonderful holiday and New Year's. Thank you all. All right, Sam. Thank you. All right. Bye all. Bye bye now.